What a special privilege it is this morning to begin our service with one of the two great ordinances of our church, the ordinance of baptism. And today we have a unique experience. We have a father and a daughter to be baptized together. And um, I thought it would be great if they both came together to be baptized together. So as we begin this morning, let's have a word of prayer. And I know that you'll covenant with me to pray for them in the days that lie ahead. Father, we thank you for this special privilege and for this ordinance which symbolizes the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord Christ, this outward symbol of an inward experience that has occurred in the lives of these who have given their hearts to you. Thank you for their courage to take a step of faith and to follow you and to trust you publicly as you've asked us to do. Thank you for their willingness to follow you in believers' baptism today, and I pray that this experience might be indelibly impressed upon their minds, that they may live and work and move and have their being all the days of their life, working and serving you. Bless them just now, we pray, and bless us as a church. And in the matchless name of Christ, we do pray, and all his people said together in agreement, amen. First of all, we have coming Caitlin Bridges. Caitlin is one of our fine young people, and she heard the gospel and has for some time in our services, but I think in Bible school she was impressed to give her heart to Christ. And so a couple of weeks ago, she came and made public her profession of faith. And so in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, Caitlin Bridges, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And in that same service, Will came. Will got courage from the decision of his young daughter who you just seen baptized Will said I want to give my heart to Christ we visited and I think Will has made a, a real decision here in life and he too follows Christ in believers baptism so in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and upon your public profession of faith in him I baptize you my brother Will Bridges in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is good to see everybody this morning, to good to see some a crowd out there this morning. That's a little different from last week. We're so glad those that have been dealing with sickness are back and feeling good. I want to remind you, those that are still dealing with the effects of that, to please keep them in your prayers and remember them as they get over uh, the sickness. We welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know you're our special guest this morning, and you're welcome here at any time. And if we can do anything to help you, uh, please reach out to me at the end of the service. And we'll get all of that lined up. Now, I'm big. I watched a movie uh, a couple years ago. And I had a good idea when someone got saved at this particular event, they had a bell. And you would ring that bell so that everyone at the event would know, well, somebody just got saved there. So I was thinking about this during VBS. I'm going to figure out a way, and these men can help me, to put a bell up for VBS. And anyone who comes to know Christ during VBS can ring that bell and all of Gillsburg will hear it, and we can celebrate it together, okay? I think that'd be great. And that reminds me, Luke 15, 7. Luke 15, 7 says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So if you would, give it up for those two one more time. It's time to celebrate. Good, good. A few announcements for you this morning. I want to remind you that our Monday nights in July start tomorrow. Start tomorrow evening. It'll begin at 7 o'clock right here uh, tomorrow night. We'll have um, the Mars Hill Praise Band. 
uh, will be leading worship. There are a bunch of kids uh, led by Clay Campbell and Grayson Campbell. They play the drums, they play the keyboard, guitars. Uh, the girls sing. It is quite the show, and, uh, and we'll really, it's a great time of worship to see those young people. They come from all schools, ASC, Park Lane. Uh, that church does that, and it really is a blessing. And I tip my hat to that church, those parents, those communities. And I really believe that is God. That's a whole sign of God being at work right there. Because number one, they have the kids who know how to play the instruments and know how to sing. They had the perfect adults there who could also play the instruments and organize them. And they're all there at the same time. It reminds me of VBS, Ashley, where God created us and designed us the way we needed to be beforehand so that later we could do his good works. Uh, and I, I really feel like that's what we're going to see tomorrow night in Mars Hill. So please be here uh, for tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, the Mars Hill Praise Band. You will know a lot of those folks are just right up the road in a Mitt County. <clears throat> and uh, I know you'll want to see them and be a part of that. And then also after Mars Hill, we'll have John Yates. Uh, John is very, very talented. He, he could preach. If I asked him to preach, he could sing. If I asked him to sing, he could be a comedian. If I asked him to be a comedian, but he's also going to do some stuff with his puppets. Uh, tomorrow night to be a little different and do something that will attract our young people, our kids, our teenagers. So please come out tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, for our first Monday night in July. After the service, we will have a little fellowship in the fellowship hall after the service, so please make arrangements for that. Now, on July the 18th, our next Monday night, we'll have the Lefebvre Quartet in concert. Uh, you'll see them there on the screen. Uh, they'll be in concert that night, kind of a, kind of a younger uh, Southern Gospel Quartet, if you will. Uh, so it should uh, reach all ages. Uh, so we encourage you to be here for that concert on the 18th. And then the last Monday night in July, the 25th, we'll have Dr. Fred Luter and Tim Moak. Uh, Dr. Fred is a previous president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He is a very well-known and sought-after speaker. Uh, if you were to go home or take your cell phone out right now and Google him, you would probably see pictures of him with uh, President Bush and other folks that he has had the opportunity to meet uh, in the past. So he is going to be a great speaker for that last Monday night. And then Tim Moak uh, will be here to, to lead the music. And I, I'm a big fan of Tim. And I always say, and you've probably heard me say it before, Tim, Tim is an active worshiper. Uh, whether he's up here holding a hymnal at the pulpit or holding a microphone or sitting at the piano, he is actively uh, worshiping God, and that's something that you and I uh, could, could learn a little bit from uh, when we see him on that last Monday night. So keep those Monday nights in your calendar, put them in your phone, remember those, and there will be a fellowship following each service in the fellowship hall each Monday night. Because of Monday nights in July, since we're coming to meet and worship on Monday nights, there will be no services on Wednesday nights. So everyone remember, there'll be no services in, on Wednesday nights in July due to our Monday nights uh, that we'll be coming together and worshiping. And then last but not least, the children participated in a reading program uh, that ran the month of June. Uh, what our library committee is trying to do now is get those books back, uh, the books that were, uh, that were the borrowed and read. Uh, we would like to get those books back. Uh, I, I realize no one is doing it intentionally. If you're like it is at my house, the kids take it into another room. You don't see it, uh, you know, somewhere visible, and you just forget about it. So if you want to check with the library committee to see if your family has any books that are out that need to be returned, uh, please do so. Those ladies are down there every Sunday morning before Sunday school, and there's also someone down there, I believe, every Sunday after the morning service. Uh, so stop by there. Uh, get a book also. We encourage you to read. I know Miss Ann uh, reaches out to me a lot, asking me for ideas on new books and current books and modern books to put in the library uh, and checking up on authors and whatnot. So encourage you to continue doing that even though our reading program is over. Now, the real announcement about this reading program is all children and grandchildren who are a part of that reading program, we will recognize you next Sunday morning. Next Sunday morning, the 17th, we will recognize you for being a part of that program. So. Any other announcements that I need to make this morning before I turn it over to Brother Ronnie? If not, it's good to see everyone again. We welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church. And my, heart, my, pr my prayer and hope uh, this morning is that our hearts are all prepared for a great time of worship. Create me a change in me in my heart, oh God. Let's uh, stand as we sing our call to worship.
Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Bring my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Would you bow with me? Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we are just truly grateful. Truly grateful to be getting over some sickness in our community. Truly grateful for a beautiful morning to come out and worship you, Lord. We just thank you for the people in this building, Lord, what they mean to this church, what they mean to this community. We lift those up that are sick, Lord, that couldn't be here, uh, that are fighting various ailments, are homebound. We lift them up to you now, uh, them and their caretakers, and we pray, Lord, that your hand of comfort will touch them and bring them a sense of hope and, and, and comfort. Uh, we just thank you for that so much. We just pray, Lord, that you'll be with our service this morning, Lord, that we will sing uh, praises to your name, that we will read uh, your scripture and what you are saying to us. We just lift you up this morning. It's not about us. It's all about you. And we just pray, Lord, that your spirit will move through this building, that you will touch each and every soul here, Lord, and that if there's a soul here that doesn't know you, our hope and prayers, they'll come to know your son, Jesus Christ, this morning right here at Gillsburg. We just pray that you'll keep us safe as we worship, keep us safe as we depart here, and bring us back here safe and sound tomorrow evening for a great time of, of worship and our, our revival and our Monday nights of July. We thank you again for this time. We just pray, Lord, that you will um, uh, remove the distractions from our minds, remove the distractions from our hearts, and allow us to just sit here and openly worship you. We thank you again. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, my little Gillsburg buddies, come on down. You're right here. Corey Kate. Shame on you. Hey, Jennings. Come on, Jake. Well, this morning we're going to talk about water. Now, what could be interesting about water? It's good to drink. Ah, that tastes good. What else is water good for? Plants. Plants. You know, I planted, watered and watered and watered yesterday morning. Addie got so hot, and then you know what God did last night? He sent a big rain. And I was so thankful because I don't have to water again for a few days. What else is water good for? Washing your hands. Washing your hands and your body, going swimming, and your hair. And your hair. Well, you know what, water, what else water is good for? What we just saw. Water is good for baptizing. We couldn't get baptized without water, could we? Now, why do we get baptized? Because Jesus did it. Good answer, Lucy, because Jesus did it. You know, Jesus was really God. So why did God need to be baptized? We get baptized because we want to wash away our old life and to have come up with a new life. So why did Jesus need to be baptized? Does anybody remember who baptized Jesus? John the Baptist. Good, Lucy. John the Baptist. Well, Jesus got baptized to show that he was a man 
but also that he was God. And he got dunked in the Jordan River, and he came up. And you know when he came up, you know what happened? A dove ascended, and God in heaven said, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? Absolutely not. So why do we get baptized? Because Jesus did. Good answer, Eddie. So remember, just like Mr. Will and Caitlin just got baptized, when you get saved and Lucy's been baptized, it won't be long before some more of you are going to get baptized. Water is best and good for baptizing. And we go, we get baptized because Jesus did, and we want to show everybody that we are, uh, our old self is gone and our new self is here. Okay? Can we remember that about water? So water's good for something other than drinking, huh? Okay, Miss Addie. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for letting them get baptized today. Amen. Good prayer, Addie. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every color, every race, all are covered by his grace. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Let's stand again as we sing, Send the Great Revival. Coming now to Thee, O Christ my Lord, trusting only in Thy precious Word. Let my humble prayer to Thee be heard, and send a great revival to my soul. Send a great revival to my soul. Send a great revival to my soul. Let the Holy Spirit come and take control and send a great revival to my soul. Send a great revival, Lord, in me. Help me that I may rejoice in Thee. Help me lead them in the homeward way. Send a great revival in my soul. Send a great revival in my soul. Send a great revival in my soul. Let the Holy Spirit with me take control. And send a great revival in my soul. Revive us again. Praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone with us. Hallelujah, find the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee. For the spirit of life Who has shown us our Savior And scattered our night Hallelujah, find the glory Hallelujah, amen Hallelujah, find the glory Revive us again Revive us again his heart with thy love. May he so be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, find the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory. Revive us again. You may be seated.
pray with me. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the privilege of being here again this morning, Lord. Lord, what a privilege it's been to see your spirit in, in, in work here this morning. Lord, we thank you so much this morning for the two that have come and given their lives to you, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you bless their lives in a mighty way, Lord. And just thank you for the blessings of each day that you give us, Lord. We thank you for this church and what it means to this community, Lord. We just pray, God, that you continue to bless us and guide us, Lord. We thank you for the country that we live in and the freedoms that we have. Lord, we just don't know how to praise you sometimes and give you the credit that you deserve, Lord. But we just thank you for everything that you do for us, Lord. We, we thank you for the ones that are here this morning, the ones, Lord, that couldn't be here because of illness and, and tragedy in their lives, Lord. We just lift them up to you, Lord. We just ask you this morning, Lord, to speak through our pastor. Give us a message this morning that will carry us through the weeks to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace is such an amazing word. And when you think about it, God shows great mercy to all of us. But more than mercy is the grace that he bestows upon us. And I know you've all heard that acronym over and over about grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. When you think about it in that context, it makes it all the more awesome that he gave his only begotten son and he suffered upon the cross for our sins. So when you think about it in that context, we truly share God's riches as Christ's expense. Rick can explain Of a rose, why can't tell the magic in the air when it snows? Marvelous can't half convey the grace of the King. The only word for grace is a No other word for grace but amazing. No other explanation will do. Unmerited favor, the song. failures I had made He didn't notice all the times that I had not obeyed He overlooked all the scars from the sin I had in me And the grace that He showed well, it still amazes me. There's no other word for grace but amazing. No other explanation.
There's no other word for grace but Thank you guys so much for that, uh, that great song. Thank you for being here. It's good to see you in God's house today. You know, we, uh, we laugh sometimes, but this is true. We have about four crowds that, that come to Gillsburg, and they just alternate Sundays, don't you, Brother Austin? <laughs> one of these Sundays, Brother Austin and Brother Doug and I are going to walk out here, and all four are going to be here at one time. And uh, we're going to take a picture of it, Donna. We want you to have your camera on the ready there. Uh, we have a lot of things going on today. A lot of folks are sick, and um, you be in prayer for them. Our prayer list won't be updated till later on in the week, but we have several additions already and some folks in sorrow, and um, so be mindful of that and be aware of that. But it's great. What a great service. Um, I know that you'll continue to pray for all of these who are in need and also to pray for Caitlin and Will. Wonderful service this morning as we begin with baptism. Um, and so you continue to pray for them in these days that lie ahead. We've been looking over these last few weeks uh, for this summer uh, at a series of messages uh, entitled America in Crisis. And we have looked at some of the crises that we as Americans are facing, and they are multiple, as you know. And we have looked at some instances from God's Word, and we'll continue for a few more weeks in this series as we look at at these occurrences and see how they were handled here and maybe perhaps draw some wisdom and some strength and some ideas perhaps for what to do uh, in a crisis. And we talked about several. Now today I want us to look at another passage, uh, a story that we don't dwell on very much, but a very interesting story, another extremely interesting story, rich um, from the Old Testament. In the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 7, gives to us a, an interesting story that we'll, we'll look at together in just a moment. We'll begin reading there in about verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 7. Newton's third law of physics says that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now, you know that's true. You don't think about it as Newton's law, but force comes in pairs. If you hit me with your fist, there is an action that occurs, and there is an equal and opposite reaction. I will recall backward because you hit me, but then if I can muster enough strength and don't pass out, I'm going to react because I'm going to hit you back, likely. You know, There are all kinds of things that that applies to. I think maybe that ought to be taught beyond the physics class. Maybe it should be taught in our psychology classes because it's true in human behavior. Maybe it ought to be taught in political science and government. Because I think our government forgets sometimes that for every action they take, there are some things that occur. It ought to be taught perhaps in marriage and family and home life. Because oftentimes we see things occurring there that are following Newton's law of motion or law of physics. It is also true that in certain instances an event or a single individual or a, a group of individuals can cause something to happen that cause other things to happen over here. You know that's true. Many of you remember Hurricane Katrina. That was a single storm. But what did it do? Boy, it caused a lot of reactions, didn't it? It caused a lot of things to happen that we had never thought of. 
What about more recently, the coronavirus pandemic? That caused a lot of things to happen that we'd never seen before. The ice storm of, of 2021, that caused a lot of things to happen that we'd not thought about too much. The actions of one event or a single individual or a few individuals affect us all. And now what do we see? Many places that you go, you see signs that, that look like this. You see them in front of every business that you can imagine. From McDonald's to the welding shop, from, from the car dealership to the, to the restaurant of any other kind, no help. You order something, can't get your order out, we don't have any help. Can't get this, can't get that. We have job loss, shortage of workers. And, and have you seen this sign? Fuel prices, oh my goodness, they've gone through the roof in places. And that's caused shortage of truck drivers because we don't have anybody to pick up the freight. And this takes one truck, one tractor has to pick up each one of these. Sometimes it'll get two, but most of the time it's one-on-one. -on -one. Don't have enough tractors. Don't have enough truck drivers. Fuel is so high in some cases, can't transport. Every day brings to us a, a new scenario, and our freight yards are, are overflowing with stuff like that. That's why some of these things are so short. And now, now we have a new one. Just a little checking on the Internet. You'll find out that food items, if they're not short now, the predictions by the analysts who know say that food shortages are coming. Now, couple that with the fact that we have a shortage of plastic, a shortage of glass, and a shortage of aluminum. What do we package or bottle or containerize most everything in? Plastic, glass, aluminum, and or maybe cardboard or something similar to that. So all of these things loom large. Inability to process and distribute, especially meat and poultry. We lost a lot of meat packing plants in the not too distant past. And we don't have enough workers to work. We, we've had problems in some of our poultry farms, and a lot of our poultry has had to be slaughtered, especially in the Midwest, thankfully not around here. This could be a huge dilemma, and it is. Baby formula. Any of you been looking for that for somebody? There's a shortage of baby formula. And I'll tell you the worst one, maybe. I can't get my favorite dog food, and my dogs are unhappy about this. It's true. Everything is being affected by what we sort of lump together as a food shortage, supply chain shortage, however you characterize it. I read an interesting statistic, and I'm going to pass this one on to it's the only one, but I thought this was fascinating. This statistic said this, today, less than 1%, less than 1% of the United States population feeds 99% of the rest of our population. Some of you know that's true. In other words, if you said that it took one worker to feed 99 people. Now it's less than one worker feeding 99 people. That's what that statistic said. That's astounding when you think about it. The Ukraine and Russia are at war. A lot of our grain and our corn for the whole world, 30% of the world's grain and corn are tied up in that war effort. Nobody knows where that's going to go. That supply is in jeopardy, not to mention that a lot of people over the world and even in our country, and many of them are our enemies, are buying up farmland and fertilizer and fertilizer and chemical plants and all sorts of other things. The fertilizer costs are skyrocketing and the supplies are dwindling. That's why I say to you, I'm not trying to be a harbinger of doom and gloom. I'm just saying, take a look. Because we need to know what we're going to do. What are our actions going to be in these multiple crises 
that we're involved in? What actions are we going to take? What are our actions in a crisis? Because make no mistake about it, whoever controls our food supply controls our nation. That, my friends, however you couch it, is national security. Whoever controls our food supply controls our nation. Now, I want you to look at this passage with me. And let me just give you a quick overview. The city of Samaria, a rather large city, had been besieged by the Arameans. The king had sent all of his forces and marshaled his forces and he had besieged that city and actually what he had done was surrounded that city. Nobody and nothing got in and nobody and nothing came out. He had them on total lockdown. The Syrian army had surrounded the city of Samaria. No water, no food, and they were dying in the city of Samaria, as you might imagine. Elisha, the prophet, we'll see, got a word from God. And that word said, tomorrow, food is going to come. Water is going to come. And the chief of staff to the king said, I don't believe that can happen. The prophet had prophesied, hear the word of the Lord. We'll read it. And the chief of staff said, look, Elisha, even if God cut some windows in the bottom of heaven so that it would just fall out and fall down on us, it couldn't do it. I don't believe it can happen. And then we'll read about four men that I really want our story to center around because I think there, there are many messages here, I know, when you'll say, well, why'd you pick this one? I hope you'll see before we're through. There, there were four men who were sitting at the city gate. Let's read this passage together. In 2 Kings chapter 7, now you, when you have time, read 6 and 7. Chapter 6 is tough. I just warn you ahead of time, if you're squeamish and, and sort of weak in stomach or don't feel real good, wait until you feel better before you read chapter 6. But you need to read these two chapters, particularly the entirety of chapter 7, because I don't have time to read it all for the sake of time, but you need to read it to get the entire context and the entire story, because we're going to focus on just a part here. Elisha replied in chapter 7, verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says about this time tomorrow at the gate of Samaria, six quarts of fine meal will sell for a shekel and 12 quarts of barley will sell for a shekel. Now you know that the city gate was, was protection and security. It was way in and way out of the city. It was also the, the center of business. It was where everything occurred business-wise, basically, that, that, that helped to fuel the entire city. Verse 3, or verse 2, Then the captain, the king's right-hand man, the chief of staff, responded to Elisha, the man of God, Look, even if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, could this really happen? In other words, this is not going to happen, Elisha. <laughs> I don't believe it can happen. Elisha announced, You will see it. You will, in fact, see it with your own eyes, but you won't eat any of what comes. Now, that's what you need to read about because we're going to kind of skip over that part. That, that's important, but I want you to see this next verse. In verse 3, four men with a skin disease were at the entrance to the gate. They had leprosy, the dreaded plague of leprosy. They were nasty looking. They had to stay away from everybody by law. They couldn't go into the city and matriculate like everybody else could. They couldn't get around anybody. They had to cross over to the other side of the street if they saw you coming. They had to cry out, unclean, unclean, cover themselves up. They couldn't go and do business. And they ate off of the scraps of what they could get and scrounge. And they stayed just outside the city gate. They said to each other, 
Why just sit here until we die? If we say, let's go into the city, we'll die there because the famine is in the city. But if we sit here, we will die also. So now, come on. Let's go to the Syrian, the Arameans camp. If they let us live, we will live. If they kill us, we'll die. So the diseased men got up at twilight to go to the Arameans camp. When they came to the camp, says they discovered that there was not a single man there. For the Lord, verse 6, had caused the Aramean camp to hear the sound of chariots, horses, and a great army. The Arameans had said to each other, the king of Israel must have hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to attack to us. So they got up and fled at twilight, abandoning their tents, their horses, and their donkeys. And the camp was intact, and they had fled for their lives. When these men came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent to eat and drink. Then they picked up the silver and gold and clothing and went off and hid them. They came back and entered another tent and picked up things and hid them. Then, then, then they said to each other, we're not doing what's right. Today is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until morning light, our sin will catch up with us. Let's go tell the king's household. How do you respond in a crisis? What actions are we going to take? Do our actions affect others? I want you to look at these guys who were sitting just at the city gate. First, they changed their position. They changed their position. They were lepers, outcasts. They couldn't move around. But there was deliberation among the four of them. They said to one another, at least they were talking. <laughs> you know, sometimes we don't even want to do that do we, when we get in a situation. They were talking and they deliberated. And then they went from deliberation to decision. They made a decision. They said, why are we still sitting here? Why are we sitting here until we die? Didn't make much sense, did it? They, they, they changed from deliberation and decision to a commitment to action. They said, we're going to make a change and leave this location. So there was determination on their part because of the facts in the case. Remember what verse 4 said? Look at it again. Look at four, verse 4. They said, if we say let's go into the city, that's in Samaria, we'll die. Because there's no food in there. Nobody in there was going to get close enough to give them any anyway. But there wasn't anything even for them to scrap. There was nothing there. Everybody in there was dying. They said if we go to the city, we're going to die. If we stay here, we're going to die. Because we're sitting here at the city gates dying now. And so their determination led them to make Another decision. Now, they didn't have too many good choices. Death one way, death if they sat here. What was left? Go to the enemy. Isn't that strange? I mean, that's just phenomenal when you think about it. If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, we're going to die. If I go to the enemy, I got 50 50 shot. If they kill me, I'll die, but I was going to die anyway. But they might, they just might not kill us. <laughs> I mean, what a choice. But it was all they had. It was the last shot. And so they, they made a decision. And secondly, I want you to see that they, they collected their provisions. Verse 5 said they got up. Now, now. Now, look at you. Just think about this. Here are these guys. Leprosy is a flesh eating disease. It, it destroys particularly your limbs, your feet, hands. Some of them, at least one of them, didn't have a foot or had part of a foot. 
They were all in pain. They were all terribly in pain. And the disease was progressing to some point when it says they got up and began to, to make their way. It's not like me walking back up this aisle or you walking down here toward me. It was painful. It was difficult. And beside that, it was night. They couldn't see. They didn't have any light. But together... Together, they, they began to, to work at In the low light, they were stumbling and falling and helping each other. Can you imagine the uncertainty and the fear that was going through their mind? Just imagine. Verse 5 said, they got to the camp. They got to the camp of the Arameans. Can you imagine the discussion that they had there? You go in first. Not me. I'm not going in there. They'll cut my head off. Well, why don't two of us go? And two of you stay back here. Well, that's, that's pretty reasonable. Which two? We'll flip for it. We'll draw straws. I mean, can you just imagine the discussion they had? After they stumbled and fumbled and fallen their way, they were now where they wanted to be, and they were in the enemy camp. <laughs> I think one of them crawled over and pulled up the tent flap, you know, and kind of peeked under there to see. And what did they find? Everybody was gone. Nobody was left in the camp. There were thousands of soldiers and fighting men there. Nothing, the scripture says, but their horses and their donkeys were left tethered. And they were gone. They, they slipped under that tent flap. They couldn't believe it. First one, the second one, the third one helped him on under, and the fourth one said, wait for me, and he slid under there too. They went in up under that, and sure enough, they were safe all the way. They'd made it at least that far, collecting provisions. They made it because of the protection of God. Do you know, do you realize we don't, I tell you, there is safety in the will of God. There is security in the will of God. There is grace that these guys just sang about in the will of God. They were safe all the way. And then they found out something. They found out not only about the protection of God that had led them that far, but they found out about the power of God. God, without them even knowing it, had performed another miracle. Now, here's another one, like the one last week. Remember, it was Army A, B, and C, and they went out to fight, and they, and they had no chance. God told the Israelites, said, go out there and stand. Who, us? These guys are armed. They want to kill us. Stand. And the prophet said, not only that, but I want you to sing the doxology while you're standing there in the face of this army. And so they believed God, they believed him, and they did. Army A and B started fighting, and they killed off all of Army C. And then Army A and B, rather than fighting the Israelites, started fighting one another until they killed off how many of them? All of them. Every last one of them. Now, ask me how God did that. I don't know. I can't answer that question, neither can any other serious theologian who will tell you the truth. We don't know how God can do what God can do sometimes, but here he performed another miracle. Somehow God caused a noise to come into the Aramean camp, and it sounded like the approach of chariots and horses and the great army, and it must have been really good. It must have been in the best sound imaginable because the Arameans said the king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians and he has sent them out to destroy us. And they headed for the hills. They took off running and didn't stop. They fled in fear. Then notice the lepers made this decision and stumbled and fumbled all the way into the camp. And when they got there, God had already removed the barriers. Isn't that absolutely unbelievable? He drove out the enemy. He will humiliate our oppressors too. 
And he will drive out the enemy out of our life if we will just center ourselves in his will. He has conquered death and hell and the grave for us. How can he do less with the enemies in our life? But look quickly at the providence of God. In verse 8, verse 8 it says, When they came to the edges of the camp, they went to a tent and they went inside And after they got enough courage to all get in there, they looked around and nobody else was there. But guess what was there? (laughs) Food and drink. The staff of life. Food in abundance. And the scripture says they went in and they began to eat, as you might imagine, with all of the stuff that was there. Nobody there but the animals. The first thing they did when they went in the tent, look at this table they left set here and all this food, and they fell upon it like a bunch of hungry hounds. God had provided for them salvation and protection, and now he was providing for them satisfaction. These lepers had never had it so good. They had never in their life had anybody to provide for them like this. Let me ask you a question. What if they had stayed at the city gate? What if they had stopped because the journey was difficult and they were stumbling and they were scared to death when they got, what if they hadn't lifted that tent flap and looked up under there to see that there was nobody there? What if they'd stopped? They had missed the blessing and the provision and all the gifts that God had waiting for them. They changed their position. They corrected. They corrected, collected their provisions, and they corrected their poverty. In these ensuing verses here, this was a unique hour. Verse 8 said, that for once in their life, they had everything they could ever imagine. They ate as quickly as they could, and they looked around and said, my soul, look at the treasure that they lived. They'd never seen anything like it. They'd never had so many things to choose from in their life. For once, they had it all, and they began to pick up stuff. The power of God had been dis- demonstrated to them. The provision of God had sustained them and kept them in a moment from starving to death with just simple food and drink. And then God had provided more treasure and more riches than they could ever imagine. They picked up the silver and gold and the clothing and they went off and hid them. They came back and they entered another tent and they picked up other things and they went off and hid that. And it said they were carrying out of there more than they could carry. And this went on for some period of time. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't imagine. Until finally we get to the verse 9. And somebody said, hold it. Just a minute. This is not right. Something's not right about this. To to hoard and to hide and to keep all of the blessings of God for ourselves. What about what about the people back in the city? Oh, I know they didn't they didn't help us much. They didn't do anything for us, but they're starving. They're dying. And God has provided more. And we could ever utilize on our own. Their concern grew, their consciousness grew, and their confession was this. They said, this is good news, and we can't hide any longer. They had to go. They had to go back to the city no matter what and share what they had found with everybody else. It was an urgent hour. The scripture says in verse 9, the urgency of the hour, they said to one another, we we can't wait any longer. I know it's it's in the nighttime, but we've got to go back. So they stumbled back across the same ground that they had crossed getting there, and they couldn't wait any longer. They stumbled back up the hill, this time back to the city gates, and it was in the middle of the night. But their commitment was so great great that they couldn't do anything else we've got to not keep silent 
We've got to go tell the king's household or we'll be punished. Tonight, we've got to tell him. And the scripture says, even though the hour was late and the king was already in bed, they went and called to the city gatekeeper in verse 10. We went to the Aramean camp and no one was there. No human sounds. There was nothing but horses and donkeys, and they were tied, and the tents were empty. And the gatekeeper called out, and the news reported to the king, and the king got up in the middle of the night. And the king says, it's a, it's a trick. It's a trap. He, the the Arameans are trying to trap us and, and get us to come out. And when we come out, they're going to slip in and come behind us, and then we'll be killed. As it is, they can't get to us because they won't invade the city. They're going to just starve us to death. But all of the evidence, all of the evidence that the four lepers brought said otherwise, they're gone. And so somebody on the staff said, King, why don't we do this? Pick a handful of guys, four or five, give them a few horses and a couple of chariots and let them go scout it out. <laughs> if they get killed... They're going to die anyway here. Let them go see. And they went. And these men were strong enough. They got to the Aramean camp. There were no Arameans there. Nothing but horses and donkeys down outside. And they found a trail leaving out of the city. What do you think was on the trail? Clothes and swords and armor and shield. And all kinds of possessions. It was so much stuff. The Arameans had fled so fast that they threw off the stuff that they had on, even their clothes, so they could run faster. And they left a trail and they followed them all the way to the Jordan River. And they came back and they said, King, it, it, it's true. It's, it's not a trick. It's true. They, they are gone. There's nobody there. We followed their trail. We found all the stuff that they left. And the king and the first officer were still in unbelief. They, they still didn't believe it. You see, that's what unbelief can do for us. It says this is a new thing. It can't be true because it's new. This is a sudden thing. It, it can't be true because it, it's sudden. This is, this is something that we can't accomplish. So it, it can't be true. It's not true. That there's only one way to do this, there's only one way that God can work. And even if God does something, it won't be enough. But it was. The Arameans were gone. The camp was left. And all of the provisions were there. And when, when you read this story, you'll see that the people left the city. And they went into the camp and they supplied their needs. They plundered that camp. They got plenty of food and plenty of water and all of the possessions and the animals and the livestock. What if the, what if the lepers had stayed at the gate in unbelief and had never taken any action in the middle of this crisis? The same thing that happened to the chief of staff. Elisha said, you'll see it. And the next day, they had plenty of wheat and barley and everything else to sell at the city gate. And so great was the press of people when they all came to get some food that they had plundered from the city and brought back. So great was the press of people that the chief of staff, the captain of the host, was knocked to the ground and trampled by the crowd, the passage said. And he died. He saw it, but he never got to eat any of it. The prophecy of Elisha from God himself came true. That's the penalty of inaction or the wrong action in a crisis. The lepers changed their position. They collected their provisions and they corrected their poverty, all because of their belief in the hand of God. I, I urge you today, don't just sit around and talk. Make a decision and make a commitment and then take some action. God may be speaking to you, the God of all creation, 
may be calling you to be saved today. Are you going to sit at the gate and take no action and listen to Satan and say, Oh, just wait. Tomorrow, another time, a better time. Just not now. Indecision, no decision, no commitment. Your actions do affect others. Yourself and others, especially in the midst of a crisis. You pray with me. Father, in the quietness of this moment, in the, in the midst of our busy lives, and all that calls out to us, all that says, here is the way, walk ye in it. And you have said to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Father, our indecision this morning, our inaction, our lack of commitment, especially in the midst of the crises that we as a nation and as a people face, may create great problems for us, but especially for others. So help us to decide as you speak to hearts today, you're calling somebody out here today. You're speaking to someone here today who's never publicly trusted you in repentance and faith, never taken that step of faith and publicly trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, never followed you in believer's baptism. You're calling someone here today. I pray you'll continue to do that in these next few moments. May your spirit so speak and so move in our midst that there be no doubt as to what it is that they need to do. Maybe they stumbled and fumbled. Maybe they need some help from somebody else to take a step. Help them to be big enough and bold enough to do that. And to make a commitment, to make a decision, to change that position where they're sitting now, where they're going to die, no matter what. There's no other way. You are the way. I pray that that decision might come before someone today and before it's everlastingly too late that they might take a step and trust you in this service. Maybe someone to come on transfer of letter in any other way that we receive members as the Gillsburg Baptist Church. This is your invitation. You be honored by the decision of our heart. We pray just now in the matchless name of Christ. We're going to stand together and sing a hymn of invitation. Brother Ron is going to sing Lead us as we sing, take my life and let it be thine forever, Lord, to thee. As we stand quietly and as we begin to sing, if you need to come, come on right now. Just come on.